Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for the Women in Tech panel webinar today. We are going to be starting in just about two minutes while we wait for some latecomers to join. So we'll be talking to you soon. Hey, Max, we have an issue. Um, yep. The whole screen has frozen for everyone. Is that was that expected? Uh, right now, I'm seeing your first slide. Are you? Can you go to the next slide? See if we see anything else. So it's not the slide. It's yep. the fact that um, all the video has frozen for everyone. I'm not. Uh, it's not frozen for me. I'm not. Not spot. Not spot. We're back. We're good. Oh, okay. I think it's just me. Is there a way I can fix it? I'm not sure, but I, it's working for everybody else, so I think uh, we soldier on, to be honest. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, yeah. I'm not going to be able to see who's presenting. Uh, do you mind if I just drop and come back right? right yeah, go back? for it. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. So sorry. Back in just a second. Deal with technical difficulty. I'm back. All right, let me get the presenter and organizer again. Can you guys see the screen? Yep. Excellent. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Are you doing better, Kathy? I am. I can see everyone live, which I think Perfect. is a good thing. So in that case, we're, I'm going to get us started, everyone. So thanks again for joining us for today's session uh, as part of our series. Hopefully you've been on some of the others, and hopefully you're going to be on some more this week. Uh, right now, we're about to join a panel discussion about women in technology. I just want to let everyone know a few things at the top. We are recording this. Uh, the recording will be made available later on. Uh, the, the slides will be made available later on as well if you'd like to see them. We have a lot to get through, but there's a few things to do right at the front. So just so everyone knows, I'm about to put something in the chat window that I just wanted to let everyone know so that no one's caught off guard. If you put this in Twitter, make sure that hashtag is kept in, is kept in there. First five people to do so are actually going to win a t-shirt. So I'm just letting everyone get a chance to get on Twitter. And I'm going to put it in there. Now, in the chat window. Another thing in the chat window is that if everyone is interested in keeping the conversation going, there's actually a link here that I'm about to put where you can join a Slack channel. Uh, where all of these discussions are going to take place, so please feel free to join and be part of this discussion. Uh, I would like to start with a couple of poll questions just to get an idea of kind of who we're who we have in the audience. So I'm about to launch the first one here. I know these are kind of blanket terms, but just please uh, pick whatever you think is the best fit for you. I'll leave this open for about 30 seconds or until we get about 75% of people voting. Whatever comes first. So we're going to give this a few more seconds. Say five, four, three, one. All right, and now to share the results here for everyone. We're looking at about 63% of you are employee, 13% manager, 23% consultant. All right, great. Now we're going to move on to another. Same thing. I'm going to do, you know, 30 seconds or about 75% of the vote. 
how you can apply. The choices are female, male, gender non-binary, or other. Leave this open for a few more seconds because we still got some votes coming in. Let's say probably about five, four, three, two, one. All right. So we're looking at 38% female, 59% male, 3% gender non-binary. All right. And then one more before we get started. So last one here. Question is, where are you hoping to get out of this webinar? And you are able to select as many as are applicable. So by all means, pick more than one if you want. So we have build confidence to learn tips and tricks to create a community to understand why there are so few women in tech and other. We have this about five more seconds. Five, three, two, and all right. This one has been pretty good. So pretty equal, except that we see to learn tips and tricks is definitely number one. And understand whether there's a few women in tech coming at number two, everything else pretty close. So great. Uh, thanks for doing this at the top with me. We do have a lot to get through, so I'm going to go right over to our moderator today, who is Kathy Lamb from CloudBees. And Kathy? Great. <clears throat> thanks, everyone. Can, it, can everyone hear me? Yep. Yep, we hear you right. Excellent. OK, great. So. Um, uh, I'm really excited to have everyone here today. Uh, we have an excellent panel. Um, this is actually something that we continued from uh, Jenkins World. Um, and so at Jenkins World, we actually uh, got one of the highest ratings. And I wanted to bring together these brilliant women back together on the panel so that we can continue the conversation. Um, so today, we're going to just spend five minutes to introduce everyone uh, who's here today. Um, we're going to then spend 20 minutes uh, on discussion. And then here's the best thing. Um, we're going to take live Q questions and, and answer them right here uh, because we, we this is for you guys. And so I, I really uh, want you to start thinking about the questions and including them into the chat window. Uh, only I will see it and I'll, I'll send these as many of these questions uh, to these wonderful ladies as, as much as possible. And then we're going to leave just five minutes of a takeaway. And uh, as, as always, um, one of the takeaways will be we'd love to have you join our Women in DevOps uh, Slack channel. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> cool. Um, so we have uh, Betsy, Isabel, and Jane here. Um, Betsy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Betsy Hernsberger. Um, I'm currently at with Adobe. Um, I manage the uh, release and uh, centralized team uh, for release engineering. Uh, here at Adobe in San Jose, and um, we uh, basically handle all the software compilation, uh, packaging, and then releasing to the Creative Cloud um, for the digital in imaging products. So that's Photoshop and, and um, uh, Dimensions and Lightroom and all the goodies that, that everyone knows today. Um, how I got started, uh, you know, or my background really, um, I, I was actually a hardware engineer when I first started, hated it, boring as heck and uh, eventually my, migrated over to, um, to software and um, loved software much better um, and found myself kind of bored with doing the regular software routines and software engineering and eventually started to do what I find very natural for women and uh, certainly for me is that uh, I started organizing things and found that um, my strengths lied in uh, trying to get optimizations and uh, looking for optimizations and naturally looking for better connections uh, in the software and uh, uh, eventually evolved into um, what is now called release engineering. It wasn't when I was uh, first starting this and uh, eventually now uh, last you know 20 years or so really perfected um, optimizing release pipelines and uh, really optimizing that that from from source code all the way out to the customer. And um, really enjoy uh, what I'm doing and plan on doing it for a little longer. Thanks. Kathy, I, I can't hear you. I don't know if I'm the only one that can't hear you. No, no, that was me. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, 
Thanks so much. Actually, with that, um, Isabel, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. So I'm Isabel Venecides. I'm the Quality Engineering Manager at Clubbies. I've been working with uh, Kathy for a year already. And I've been doing more or less the same things for uh, around 10 years. And it's actually managing engineering teams to help organizations deliver software um, faster, with higher quality, and in a more efficient way. Um, I started as a developer, actually, a Java developer. I spent two years doing that. And then after, you know, um, my team members and, and my manager realizing that I was, you know, paying attention to detail, processes, and trying to, you know, make things better all around, they proposed me to move into a quality role. I didn't even know what, you know, quality assurance was at that time. Uh, so that's how I started to self, you know, teach and, and, you know, learn and create a quality team for the first time in, in my life. And I continue to do that um, until now in Club Beast. Uh, right before, I was working for Atlassian, where I was the only uh, woman in a 200 people division. I have to say it was the infrastructure division, but, you know, it's a, it's a highlight. Excellent. Thanks so much, Isabel. And uh, Jane, please introduce yourself. So, hi everyone, I'm Jane Grohl. My present role is CEO of the DevOps Institute. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with uh, DOI, we are the continuous learning community around DevOps and have been introducing uh, content and certifications and community around some of the emerging practices. Really proud to say that we, we now have 105 partners around the world. Uh, that are, are really trying to bring these practices to life. Um, you know, unlike Isabel and Betsy, um, my career kind of started off by accident. Um, I had a degree in music and I couldn't find a music job. And so I ended up at a law firm and uh, it was a long time ago and it was a Unix shop and I self-learned Unix and eventually ended up in their IT department on the operational and support side. Uh, mostly because uh, most of the developers really needed an interface to the users. And then from there, really self-taught. I mean, I, I've had a, a, a lot of opportunity to grow my technical skills, to work in a bunch of different vertical markets. Um, and then about 14 years ago, I was a, a senior IT director. And through, you know, what's not uncommon to a lot of people, found myself kind of at a crossroads in my career and started a training company. And um, been very blessed that that training company, 14 years later, is still very viable. And about five years ago, sort of fell into DevOps and recognized this was emerging as a, a, a really viable set of practices, um, but clearly undefined, unlike some other frameworks. And so really lucky to work with some amazing people and stood up the DevOps Institute about three years ago. So. Uh, really excited to be here and so excited particularly to be back with Isabel, Betsy, and Kathy after Jenkins World. So thanks for the invitation. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm just going to start this off with a very quick, like, you know, here, here's the state of women in tech. And, uh, you know, it looks okay, but really we could be doing a lot better. Um, and, you know, I've been scratching my head because whenever I, I present it with a problem, I'm going, hmm, what's, you know, what's causing all this? What's the systematic approach to fixing this? Because here you see, you know, 28% of the um, software jobs are held by women. Uh, only 11% of uh, execs are, are women. And uh, in fact, when you look at startups, it's even fewer, right? And, and then the but here's the weird thing, right? Like you would think that, oh, well, it's because women are good or whatever, right? But no, it turns out that if you have women as leaders, the companies tend to do better. In fact, products tend to be, um, tends to empathize with their customers more, right? Um, things just flow better. And so the question goes, why are there so few women that are successful in tech? And with that, I'm going to go reverse back out uh, the, the way we asked our questions. So Jane, uh, would you like to spend a couple of minutes just answering this? Sure. So um, it, it, it's disturbing to me that um, several decades after I was fortunate enough to join the tech community that we're still concerned that there are not enough women successful in tech. And I would tell you, Kathy, one of the, the statistics that you just showed was the most disturbing to me, and that's the number of women that are startups. 
right? I'm not quite a serial entrepreneur, but um, I've been I'm very, very lucky um, in, in being able to do that. But so I think the question for me is also why are there so few women in tech and why are so few women in uh, doing tech startups and, and what's really holding people back? You know, we're going to talk about a bunch of things today. We're going to talk about safety at work and we're going to talk about uh, boys clubs and we're going to talk about a bunch of other stuff and I think all of that contributes to uh, why we uh, don't necessarily encourage women uh, to, to join tech because um, they know that that their path is maybe not going to be as easy as some others and I think that's that's certainly a, a piece of it. I think when we start to look at diversity in organizations and and start to look at um, kind of the glass ceiling of sorts there are preconceptions, I think, about women in tech. Um, you know, I, I'm a very big believer that that you are you, and that sometimes women in tech are expected to not be themselves, and and I think that deters people from being successful in tech. But I think generally, it's it's if you look at tech startups, if you look at all the statistics that you just just saw, there is an and and you guys taught me this the other day. There's an unconscious or conscious bias that women are just not as technical as men and that's nonsense, right? They're, they're, that's absolutely uh, total nonsense. But that glass ceiling is real and I think it's hard to break through that glass ceiling um, because of that, that conscious or unconscious bias. Thanks so much, okay. Jane. Isabel? <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you said, Jane. And I mean, I'm, I've, I'm, you know, lately reading a lot of what's going on, especially in the Valley, where uh, young women come with projects to um, people to get money, and they just get rejected straight away. And I think, you know, as part of that unconscious bias, like, would I risk my money and put it in the hands of these, you know, young women that doesn't really know what she's doing? So that's, you know, the starting point, right? We have a lot of closed doors just because we are women. women. Um, so that's one of the things. I think the funnel has got better. Um, so I recruit a lot. I'm actually, you know, recruiting. I have open positions right now. Uh, I get more women applying. The problem is um, that I think when women get into the field, uh, you know, they just leave. And I think that's a bigger of a problem. So I would, you know, rephrase the question like, um, not only why there's so few women at tech, but why whenever they get into the field, they leave. They tend to live and there are high percentages of women that just live and I think it's because you know the environment is not always um, that friendly um, just because you are a minority is just hard to start with so not because you're a woman a woman uh, it's just the same for all the minorities I would say um, so let's say they have a joke at the office and you're the only lady in the room and it's a you know a joke about ladies then you would take 100% of that joke right and you would even make it personal just because you're the only one representing that, that group there. So it goes the same ways for all the minorities and I think that's one of the, the hardest parts. Like uh, we get into the field and it's, it takes a lot of you know, effort and energy to keep up with all that pressure. The other thing is also that since you're a minority and you know that they have you know, this thoughts of, hey, you're a woman, then you're less technical. You try to prove yourself even more and that's something, sometimes is counterproductive. Um, so I would say that sometimes you're your own enemy, um, trying to stress, you know, everything out and, you know, try to achieve a lot of things super fast to prove that you are really worth that position when you shouldn't be doing that. So I would say that together with, you know, a lot of uh, sexist and, um, events that have been all around the news, I think it's a good combination for not making this field a lot of, you know, very attractive to, to women in general. Yeah, another, the last one that I would like to make is also that I remember when the first um, Spanish astronaut went into the space, all the kids wanted to be astronauts, right? Uh, so I think we don't promote uh, uh, female tech leaders enough so that, you know, little girls want to be like them and, and look out for them and say, yeah, I want to do the same as this lady is doing and I want to become, you know, the next other lovelies. So I think there's also about uh, self-promotion that we're missing there. Yep, that, that makes sense. And Betsy, do you have any comments to make as well? Yeah, I guess you know, for me, when I look at this question, I, the word successful just pops out for me. And 
you know, I think we have to define what success is in life, and I'm not sure that um, I'm not convinced that uh, the general, you know, generally, if all the people on the phone, you know, I think if we all asked what success means, we'd get a very different answer. And I don't think there is a general, uh, you know, um, definition of what success is. I think it's very personal, and and that's kind of at the root of of uh, women in tech for me is that I think women define success very differently. I know I do. And um, I think that uh, I've been in the business for a long time and uh, I, I found the niche that I'm good at, that I enjoy, that's right for me and my family. And um, I and I'm feel very successful with that. So others, you know, may say, well, I'm not a CEO, I don't own my own company, so therefore I'm not successful. Uh, so I think I think we have to you know kind of roll it back and say you know um, maybe we're we're looking at this from the wrong angle maybe we need to look at you know happiness or satisfaction in the job and so how many women are are satisfied in tech um, I think that the number would be a lot higher um, because I think we're putting this this we even as women are putting this this bar out there that maybe we don't necessarily want it all achieved. And uh, and for me it's about, you know, satisfaction at work is more of, you know, a, a balance of social, uh, technical and, and, and you know, and uh, contribution. And, um, you know, so women are great contributors to uh, a company and to, you know, software in general and or whatever, you know, tech field that they're in. And I think that um, you know we need to be cautious in how we we talk to each other about success. And I know for me, you know, I, I like the way that Isabel put it with um, having role models in the field. Um, it's not all about just making sure that you know the CEOs are out there, and there definitely is you know some real role models out there that are women in tech. But personally, for me, I don't really have a lot in common with them. I don't see myself in common with them. I think my my values as a person are very different than theirs. And so, you know, I don't tend to look to that. What I try to model for the people that I know and for my children is um, a balance between, you know, life and, uh, you know, outside life and work and making sure that you are satisfied along the way and that your needs as a person are met as well, and that uh, you know you're contributing at a pace that you feel good about. And I think that that you, know, you have that healthy mix of of uh, contribution versus reward, um, that you you feel really good about yourself and you feel successful. So you know that's my message: is to kind of watch um, how we how we think about success. Yeah, I, I'm, I completely agree. Um, just a few comments from what everyone uh, talked about. Um, Isabel, I agree that, uh, or actually Jane, I, 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 I agree that you know the number of women VCs and the number of women CEOs, um, you know, it, it, not all women want, like, they want to be a CEO, but for the ones that do, you know, they should get the same chances as anyone as long as, you know, they, they have a great idea. And what was very heartening for me uh, just two days ago, uh, and I just sent it to the chat window, was that um, there's now a group of women who are setting up office hours, right? And so it's it's um, to, so that they can share, uh, you know, their suggestions on how to how to help women um, get ahead in the startup world, which is so competitive. And so it, I'm really excited to see that um, there there's more movement around like creative ideas on on getting women in there. So I. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna head to the next question really quick. Um, just you know, I think a few of you touched upon this uh, in the intros, but um, what do you like when you think back to your career? Um, was there something that that um, helped you get to where you are? Um, that maybe it was um, you know a, a point in time that you made a, a certain decision or you know, if there, if you hit any roadblocks, you know, you wanted to be in tech, but then, you know, something happened. How did you overcome that to get to today? Yeah, so um, in my case, um, so as I said, I started as a developer, and then I was offered the opportunity to, 
you know, lead a quality team. I tried to, you know, put a team together, try to do stuff. And, and I was pretty happy because I didn't know what I didn't know. But when things got serious and I moved to bigger and bigger companies, I started to, you know, lose confidence. All of a sudden, I realized that, you know, I, I really don't know what I'm doing. And I started to have all these kind of conflicting feelings that I think, you know, everybody goes through when you assume a lot of responsibility. And I realized that I was, as Betsy said, not satisfied with my job. It was not about success. It was that every day I would go home thinking, I haven't accomplished anything. And I realized that the only way to change that was to actually measure what I was doing, being able to measure uh, that I was moving the needle in terms of quality, because, you know, especially in my field, when you're dedicated to quality, it's kind of difficult to measure things. So when everything is going fine, you don't hear anything. When things go wrong, there are lots of fires, but it was difficult for me to, you know, keep up motivation and, and you know, and keep looking forward to goals and, and understand, okay, I'm here and I want to go there. So how do I know if I'm moving the needle? So I decided to be 100% metric oriented. Um, and that way, when I saw that my metrics were going towards the wrong direction, I was able to actually, you know, change my strategy and overcome the problems, you know, slowly over and over and over. And that also gave me indirectly a way of proving objectively that I was actually causing an impact in the company. So all those worries that, you know, I needed to prove myself, that I needed to, you know, to, you know, accomplish good things and all that, they were just gone. Because from the beginning, I had those metrics that I was measuring over time and I was able to say, okay, don't worry, don't stress out. You're doing well, you know, you're getting where you're uh, trying to get to. So it was key to me to be metric and objective oriented um, to get where I am right now. And you know, for the sake of also mental health, so to say, just because of all the competition and because of all, you know, the kind of, you know, need of proving yourself even more the male. And, and, and if, um, I'll jump in uh, next because I agree. I mean, the proving yourself aspect um, is sometimes uh, a, a motivator and sometimes a demotivator, right? I started in tech uh, mostly because my all male. Um, team and and you know we were all at that point co-located in the same building in the same place and it was all men and they needed truthfully they needed somebody to interface with the users and they needed an extrovert and truthfully they needed a quote unquote nurturing woman right to kind of serve as that interface uh, to the users because truthfully that wasn't their skill and there wasn't necessarily their interest They were all software developers or infrastructure folks and and um, And again, they were technical and I wasn't and so for a lot of my career because I was on the operational side and uh, with a, a big emphasis on post-production uh, Infrastructure operations and support it was always well. You're not as technical as we are Right, because I'm not a developer, you know, so you're not as technical as we are. So therefore, your value to the organization is is a little bit more limited. And and over time, again, I had to self-teach, I had to learn, and I'm still not a developer. And I'm very proud of the fact that I'm not a developer because I know some really awesome developers, right? But but certainly I'm I'm very technical. And it took me a long time to be able to kind of acknowledge that for myself that I was as technical as my colleagues and, and I needed to stop trying to compete with them or prove myself according to that. Um, the, the other thing, I, I just want to um, just say one more thing and it goes to something Kathy said before and I don't want to really drill in on the whole VC thing or whatever, but here's the reality. If I were starting a cosmetics company, I would get VC really quickly, all right? If I'm starting a tech company, um, I'm not 100% sure, and I don't know if it's gender bias or not, but I would bet it's, it's, it wouldn't be quite as easy. And we have a lot of good startups in other spaces. The question is, why not? So I'm going to let that go, but it is something that kind of, you know, just sticks with me a little bit. Sorry, uh, I apologize. I'm posting the um, Betsy, would you like to add some comment to that? Oh, you can't hear? Okay. She's uh, I, I, can, I can hear you, so. Great. Okay, I'm going to move on really quickly because Betsy seems to have some um, audio problems. Um, so question three, I, I didn't think we would actually get uh, get there today. And that is, um, 
do you believe there's a boys club? And uh, if, if so, how do you reach it? So I'm, I'm really curious to uh, get your answers for that. Um, anyone want to jump in? Can Betsy not hear us? Betsy, can you not hear us? Yeah, I just got in again. Sorry, I lost um, my power source on my phone went dead. Sorry. We're having some electrical issues here. Apologize. No worries. No worries. Um, uh, so, um, actually, did you have any comments that you'd like to make um, on this previous question? Or shall we go ahead? Yeah, you know, I, I think for, um, you know, t listening to what the others were saying, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I, and I also think it's really important for us to, you know, think about, um, you know, women generally, uh, my advice for, the, the, for the, the women that I see, you know, that I mentor and work with today is, you know, to stop trying to prove yourself and actually start looking at the company's needs and trying to actually solve those needs and um, you know looking at what you know what are the what are the things that you can contribute that actually will display your skills and and uh, actually solve some of the company's problems and once you start focusing away from yourself um, then you tend to and you start to like Isabel said you start to see some success then that confidence will grow and uh, and the only thing I think we have to caution ourselves with as women is I, I see over and over again that women are very uncomfortable with exposure. They they tend to um, you know stay in the back of the room. They don't always sit in the front. And when there's something uh, a bunch of people in a room, it's oh it's hard for especially. Um, new in their career folks to put their hand up and say, hey, I have something to say or to add to the conversation. And so I think that uh, women have to get really comfortable about um, being out there and exposing themselves and um, sharing what they're learning, what they're doing. And the more you share, the more confidence that you'll have and the more com confidence that the company that you're in will have in you. And that will and then, you know, get you on your path to success. And it all really starts with confidence and, um, and looking outside of yourself into what's going on with the company and how can you solve difficult problems. I would also like to add to that one point and that what you said, Betsy, goes in two directions. So it's you trying to satisfy the company needs, but also, I mean, we're in a very fortunate market where you can change jobs if the company you're working for doesn't solve your needs. So don't be afraid of, I mean, don't think that it's always your fault. Don't think I am not fit for this job. It's maybe, you know, the company culture is not good or, you know, the role is not the one that, you know, it was supposed to be or it could be that also. And it takes sometimes time to realize that is not you, it's just that the environment where you're working at is not adequate. Uh, and you need to decide the, the fights that you want to pick up, right? And sometimes it's not healthy for you to go against the whole world and try to solve all the problems. Just move on. There are lots of companies. If you don't feel like you're valued or well-treated, um, you know, try to leave the place better for the next women that are going to join that company, of course, but just move on. There are lots of tech companies where, you know, they have a really good and, and women-friendly environment. So I recommend you to also make that, you know, kind of reflection and think, is it me or is it the company? Excellent. Excellent. And I'm a big advocate of that. If you're not comfortable, move on. <laughs> Love it. Um, so at this point, I was, uh, I, I'd like to, add, you know, just very quickly touch on this question before we open up to Q&A, because I, I'm, I'm not seeing that many questions. Uh, so, um, I guess, you know, really, is there a boys club? Uh, and if so, how do you reach it? I'd love to hear your viewpoints, and I, I expect them to be on different, pretty extremes. So, um, anyone would like to take a shot? I can oh, jump in there. Yeah, go ahead, Betsy. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that certain companies definitely have what I would consider, quote, um, boys clubs. Uh, what I would define a boys club as is things where the male executives tend to hang out together, they they party together, they lunch together, they hang out in each other's offices together. When there's something going on, they reach to each other for advice and counsel, and they uh, typically do not allow um, even men. It's, it's really just a small cluster of people 
you know, usually five, six, seven people that they've decided that they're going to, you know, um, create a little bubble around. Um, so it's not just women that are affected by boys clubs, but there are men who are not a part of that boys club that are also, you know, affected by this. So it's not just a women issue. Um, I don't think it, you know, for me, I, I've definitely ran up against this several times. Um, it's very exclusive uh, of everyone else other than the people in that boys club. And I've noticed that when promotions and things come along, they tend to reach to their own or people that they like or those people in that club recommend. And so I think it's really important for anyone who is on the periphery of one of these clubs, whether, and I've also seen women do this too, by the way, I've seen women clubs. <laughs> I've seen, you know, a couple women that, that kind of act like this that are in control of a, a department. It's probably not as, as common, but you definitely see the boys clubs. Um, especially at the higher levels. And um, for me, you know, I like to call a spade a spade. And so when I see that, uh, I tend to call it out. And uh, I think that um, you can't fix anything till you identify it. And you can't, uh, you know, you can't even address it in conversation until you put it on the table. So for me, you know, I tend to one-on-one -on -one talk with an individual in the club or maybe all of the individuals individually um, and let them know that you know I'm seeing this this exclusion and can you help me understand why or what I need to do you know to be a part of that um, to be included in your uh, you know whatever it is advice or console or whatever is going on there and I think that in in my experience, I've been very successful in doing exactly that in a very subtle nice way I mean you obviously can't push it too hard, um, but you have to be able to at least call it out in a gentle way to say, hey, you know, are you aware that you're appearing very exclusive um, and that you are excluding these people and that your appearance is, um, this is the way it appears to the people in the team. And most people, you know, the good ones, will acknowledge that and, and work really hard to try to make that not happen again. But if you ignore it and you just, you know, uh, live with it. It'll live with you for a very long time, and uh, I think you you have to do something. So I don't know if you breach it, you just stop it. <laughs> That's my comments. <laughs> Love that, Jane. Oh. Um, would you like to add something? Let me let me build on what Betsy said. So, um, is is there a boys' club? Well, historically, there always has been a, in a male-dominated space. Uh, and Betsy, you're right. These these are are men that you know, hang out together, hang out in each other's office, eat lunch together, um, and, and a lot of the business happens during those type of situations, right? Whether it's lunch, whether it's happy hour, whether it's hanging out in an office. So a lot of casual business is done. Um, I, you know, is it a boys club or is it a cool kids club? I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure whether, whether we've kind of transcended into, you know, just cool kids and in a male dominated space. Uh, the cool kids are going to both be mostly men, but but I, I also think we're in really dangerous times right now. You know, with all of the allegations of sexual harassment, women may not want to breach that club, right? Or go hang out and and go to happy hours uh, for a variety of reasons. Men may not be comfortable, um, you know, because of of you know putting themselves in a situation that may eventually be perceived rightly or wrongly. As as being something that that uh, crosses over gender roles, so um, I think I think it's a really really difficult time to do that. I think Betsy, you're right. You know, part of it is is being comfortable with yourself, right? You know, no means no, um, but also being comfortable being you know with the boys um, and not and not you know either uh, you know feeling intimidated or or you know making yourself the girl and just being one of the people and and it's very very difficult it is it is very very difficult um, to do that I said particularly in today's environment where there's just so much going on you know some of it from a while ago and I know we're going to talk about that but um, I, I, I think it is it, it's a little tricky are you a member of the cool club are you comfortable you know kind of uh, being a part of the boys club are the boys really comfortable given 
you know, concerns about allegations. I mean, there's just so many complex issues that are going on today that just don't make this any easier. That, that's really good feedback. And um, Isabel, I'm going to um, put a slight twist to the question because uh, I, I, I received a, a comment saying that um, how do you deal with the boys club when you don't feel you can just move on, right? Like, Betsy, congrats for being able to just go up to them and say, hey, look, I see what you guys are doing. Stop it, right? But let's say... <laughs> I'm not quite like that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But let's say, they, you know, you're aware of it and, you know, they, they're going to continue and you don't and and uh, you don't feel like you know it's fair to move on. Like uh, Isabel, any suggestions there? Yeah. So it's not exactly about this situation because I don't think of, of being in such in such form. But I mean, if you move these to lower levels, I mean, I think we're thinking about doing business, uh, happy hours, and all that. Like we're talking about C's, right? Levels. If we move down to team leads uh, or managers. Um, I've seen, you know, people trying to suppress women uh, just because they feel uh, them as threats. Uh, so I've seen that in, in, you know, in jobs. Like I'm doing something, I'm achieving something, and you're trying to make sure that nobody knows, or you're trying to lower the value of what I'm trying to do. And my recommendation there, which is a kind of a similar situation, is to keep highlighting uh, the good things that the women around you are doing, and try to make sure that your accomplishments are heard. So self-promotion, and I'm really, really bad at this, but I think this is something that you and your teams would benefit from. So if you're trying to be hidden by this boys club and you're lacking information to make decisions, you know, just, you know, make sure that you highlight that you're lacking decisions, uh, sorry, information to make decisions, escalate that, and make sure that all the accomplishments and all the good things that you and your team are doing you know, are known, well known through the company and also, you know, congratulate female colleagues and, you know, promote what they're doing because I don't know why we're not well at doing that. So do, it, do that for them. Try to help them. Try to remind them, hey, you've done a good job in this and, I, you know, everybody should know about it. So that's kind of, you know, my experience has been a little bit different. You know, translating that to my experience, that's my advice. Excellent. Um, and a and, uh... I'm going to ask uh, the next question um, that someone brought up, and actually, I've seen it myself. Uh, let me see if this works. No, it doesn't. Uh, I, I, I updated it on a different slide, but it didn't work. Um, so, um, so I asked my 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 husband the same question. I'm like, hey, uh, you know, why why is it that like men are treating women differently? And he actually said, you know what, <clears throat> it's not a question of guys going into work and saying, I don't, I'm only going to work with men. Um, they're going to, he's going to work with whoever works, you know, whoever is a, a team player and they work really well together. Now, the weirdest thing I've noticed uh, as a woman in, in tech is that oftentimes women aren't doing the things that you just mentioned, which is being advocates for each other, being, you know, like giving the honest feedback and then trying to raise each other's up. In fact, it feels like, and this is the exact quote, I experienced that oftentimes women suppress other women in non-professional manners to, to hinder their career. Now my question is, I, have a, I, I think I haven't answered mine, but like why do you think people do that, women do that at, in, in, at work? I mean, um, have you experienced it and um, you know, what, what can we do to fix that? And I'm willing to open this to anyone. Well, I so think it feels uh, like we're at yeah, that one. That's a hard one. Uh, I think that's a very difficult thing to deal with, but I think you're right. That I have definitely seen women harder on other women uh, than they are on their male cohorts. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we tend to, at least I personally tend to, you know, kind of give guys a pass sometimes if they're doing something that's, you know, uh, you know, seen as rude or something, uh, you know, impacting me. Um, and you know, I'm, I'll definitely address it, but it doesn't some it doesn't always affect me in an emotional way, and or I don't allow it to affect me as an emotional way. But for some reason, when uh, a peer woman uh, does something that's seen as you know intrusive to me, um, there is an emotional piece to that. There's a a little bit of hurt or or something that goes on inside of you. So um, and I've I've definitely noticed that, and I've noticed that some women are not aware of it. 
Um, I think the key to solving that problem or to ending that is to be aware that we have these internal biases um, about other women and how they behave in the workplace and, uh, and to try and overcome that, you know, by, by uh, challenging your thoughts and saying, you know, what, is, what exactly is going on here? What's her point of view? What, you know, where is she coming from? And giving her uh, that time and, and trying, I think it, it, you know, what I'm trying to say is that it comes from a gender, a, a bias internally to us. And, uh, and we have to be, we have to be um, aware of it ourselves. We, and we can't be hard on our peers. Uh, we have to, you know, uh, we have to help them instead of trying to, you know, let them deal with it themselves or, or uh, you know, in some way um, we're, we're navigating the world by ourselves, but the boys have got the boys club. So <laughs> we've got to do a better job of reaching out to fellow women and supporting each other and helping each other to be seen and to grow. Great. Um, and I'm, I'm glad uh, you brought up um, unconscious bias training. I'm really glad Adobe does that. I've just asked uh, the, the, you know, people who are on the call, um, has everyone heard of unconscious bias training and have you taken it in your uh, company or uh, is this a new topic for you? Um, so feel free to like respond to that. Um, Jane, you, you also had a comment about the question, um, which is, you know, women, women and women interactions at work. Would you like to? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky because I work with an amazing group of women and men. Um, and, um, and, and it's interesting because um, I haven't run into a lot of that directly, although I certainly have um, experienced it and maybe unconsciously even. Um, you know, kind of looked at a, 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 another woman, um, you know, maybe not with the same generosity, um, you know, as Betsy said, the same forgiveness. I, I wonder, and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to place, you know, a Dr. Phil here, but I do wonder whether um, some of it is with so few women succeeding in tech that there is a unconscious, I would like to think it's unconscious, a rivalry that says if only so many women are going to rise, it's going to be me um, and it's not going to be you. I don't know if that's part of the subconscious mentality, but we do know that that statistically there are a lot less women that, that rise and, and we do have to prove ourselves more and we do have to work harder at it. So I, 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 don't, I, I, I would hope that's not the case. I'm very convinced if it is, it's not necessarily Conscious. And by the way, Kathy, as you know from our conversation of the day, unconscious bias training to me is very new and amazingly exciting. I mean, I've talked to a bunch of people. Uh, I'm in a conference this week and asked them whether they're familiar with it. And and really, it is a new concept. Uh, but then we actually launched into conversations about, well, do you think you suffer from unconscious bias sometimes? And universally, everyone I've spoken to kind of paused and went, probably. Um, so, um, so you know, it is a little bit of a self-reflection, which I, I, I just think is, is awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's finding the unknown unknowns that you're not aware of. And um, it, it's really cool that this is a great conversation starter. Um, and, and I think what you're saying, Jane, is right, because um, men don't look at like, oh, there are only, you know, 80% of us who are leaders. Uh, I need to be like, I need to beat out the other men. No, they, they just go... I like if I want to be a certain role, I'm going to reach that level. Whereas it seems like women are thinking, you know, they're thinking of shrinking the circle, or they're thinking of like this is the this is the pie, or this is the pie as it is, and there's only so much of it. Whereas you know we really need to be like increasing the size of the pie. Uh, and I love pie, by the way. I love pumpkin pie. <laughs> I'm going to take this offline, but. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do want to point out one thing that I don't think we've even acknowledged today. If you look at the, when we did our polling question, yeah. right, the large majority of attendees today are men. And, and by the way, I applaud that. Um, oh, and I, yeah. I'm sure everybody else does, right? But, but, but I, I think that's, you're right. That's because they're trying to understand. Um, hopefully that's why that's why they're attending to, to be able to understand that. So I just needed to jump in and say that when you when it just it sparked that for me. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries, no worries. Thank you for bringing that up, Jane, because that's something I noticed when we first saw that. I was surprised to see that, 
and um, and there does seem to be some uh, you know maybe uh, later on we open it up for questions we can hear more about why uh, uh, so many men today but I, I do think it has to do with them trying to breach in and find out what the heck's going on with this women thing you know <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. coming through actually we've been opening it up for questions they um, I don't think the way the set is set up they can actually like verbally ask the questions but I've been doing that right now so it's great uh, this is the next question and um, it's how do you approach a salary discussion with your manager when you feel like you're being underpaid and so this is like just a generic <laughs> question and it could be you know male female male male female female I don't really care like how have you been able to successfully do that and um, how do you especially do that if you're like female and you you know and you want to you, you don't have the courage yet just to ask that yeah, I think I think you know it all goes back to being able to measure objectively your success and what you're adding to the to the company. So if you are able to say, "Hey, um, this is what I've done to the for the company," and you know this is what I've done compared to other um, you know people that is on my same level, I think you know I should get a pay raise. The problem is that in general salaries are not open, so they're not public, so you never know if you're underpaid until you become a team lead. So I was in that situation. And then you start to see what your reports make and you realize that you make sometimes less even though you have more responsibilities or you have been in the company for longer. Uh, so then is when the, you know, the crucial conversation starts and then is when you start to realize, okay, here is the problem. But I think you know, it, it's a tough one since unless people openly talk about their salaries, you're never gonna know. But if you do know, then you know just bringing responsibilities and bringing achievements on the table and also even bringing studies in the market i think that's you know what probably you know is going to help you choose objective data what i don't think it's a good idea is bringing feelings so just say i am a person it doesn't matter my gender so don't focus that on am i you know i, I am a woman so you know you're paying me less because i am a woman it's like more you know i am a person that is doing the same job or even better there's these, these other group of people, so I should be paid equally or better if I'm doing a better job. So I would, I would approach the conversation that way. That's how I have done it for me and for getting pay raises for my reports. And that's how I succeeded to have a case beforehand and be prepared with objective data that is going to get me what I want. You know, I'd like to jump in there for just a second. You know, I definitely agree with what Isabel said. Um, in addition, I think it's really important for everyone to understand how corporations work and, and to understand what, you know, what are the capabilities here. And for most corporations, there is a range for every single job. Every job title, every job type has a range. And there's a, you know, a low in the range, high in the range, and a mid. Um, and most companies are using some kind of industry standard um, for that, there's companies that, that we purchase this information from, and most of the HR departments are actually, uh, you know, have this this data. And um, if you're a senior engineer, you know, for or there's categories for those, and uh, knowing what role that you're playing, what what level that you're at, there is a you know a level uh, that that is expected in that range and so the question is uh, not necessarily um, am, you know can I get a raise it's more of where do I sit in my range um, and how do I get you know uh, you know am I sitting in the lower part of my range or am I sitting in the higher part of my range and uh, those of us that are in the, the mid or higher part of the range then you're really not asking for a raise you're asking for a promotion and the promotion is how do I get into the next range that has a higher range to it? And, um, and understanding what that range in the next category is. Um, and trying to, most companies try to keep people in the mid and uh, in the middle of the ranges. And, um, uh, it, and sadly, it really doesn't have a lot to do with how well you're doing. Um, today, in most companies, the people that are poorly doing their jobs are eliminated. And that's just the way it is. And uh, the people that are doing, most people are doing a really good job at what they do. Some are better than others, but uh, when you're talking about salary in increases today in the modern world, we're talking about getting a percentage every year to those people that, 
the manager decides uh, is is going to get it or not, and it's usually displayed, you know, dispersed pretty fairly. So uh, really, as you, it's really unfortunate when someone comes to me and says, "Hey, I need a raise," you know, I pull out the range and say, "Well, here you are within the range. You're looking at a promotion, and here's what you have to do in order to get to the next promotion." So so make sure that you understand, you know, what you're asking for. Are you asking for um, you know, are you low in your range, and that needs to be corrected, uh, which means getting a raise, but it means correcting that, um, and how are you going to correct it, and, um, or uh, I'm at the high in my range, and I'm ready for a promotion, what, what do I need to do to achieve that promotion? So that's really the dialogue you should be having. You're muted, Kathy. Thank you so much. Um, we're at the last five minutes, and normally we, we wanted to wrap up, but a few people had asked this question, so I didn't want to leave before we did the wrap up without asking this. So, like, um, right now, I'm like one of the only females in my team in San Jose, uh, beside one other, uh, the, the, um, the SVP of HR. Um, so, my question is, you know, how do we make women feel safe? Uh, and why was there all the silence? And this reverts back to really, um, uh, you know, the allegations that are coming up in, in Hollywood and in tech. And, you know, why was there silence for so long, right? What, what's the best way for us to do something better in our workplace situation? And, you know, how can everyone else who's on, on the phone, you know, really make it safe for women and minorities to feel comfortable in, in, in the workplace? Anyone so, want to yeah, if you don't mind, let me let me jump in on that because I think it's important. Um, so I, I'm going to go in reverse and figure out and, and talk about why was there silence for so long. So it, what was really fascinating to me was the Me Too campaign, right? Where suddenly you had hashtag Me Too, um, without having to necessarily explain um, what happened to you or how it happened to you, was just acknowledging that it did happen to you. And I thought that was remarkable, right? Because Many of these stories are very personal. Many of these stories are very intimate. And I think um, in many cases, society accuses women of being um, victimized by their own fault. And I think that probably answers a lot of why there's silence. Because it must have been something you did, something you wore, something you said, something you intimidated that put you in that situation. So um, I, I think that's probably a contributor. And, and again, it was really fascinating, the whole Me Too. We need to make workplace safe for women um, because we'll never get more women in tech. We'll never get more women in male-driven uh, organizations and uh, industries until we make it safe for women. You know, things like unconscious bias training, I think, is really remarkable because I would like to believe that 99.9% .9 of the men out there do not go into work with the intention of harassing a woman, right, or doing something uh, something really horrible. Maybe that's a high number, right? Um, maybe there are, are a lot more predators out there than, than I would like to believe. But I would like to think that the average employee, male or female, doesn't go into work today and say, hey, I'm going to go harass somebody. Um, so part of it is training. Part of it is sensitivity. Part of it is, is women feeling comfortable uh, being able to share their stories. Part of it is, is a little bit of... of um, kind of sanity checking where you know there's there's um, there's sensitivity there's uh, but it, we can also fall on the other side where there's uber sensitivity so we're we're actually less productive because of that so I think a lot of it is just training and I think a lot of its interaction and I I think it's also commitment there's a great group called um, gender Avenger um, you know I know uh, everyone here does a lot of panels and discussions and whatever. Gender Avenger, Avenger is for men to say, I won't participate in a panel uh, where there, there isn't a woman. That neutralizes some of the, uh, of, of the events because it does not, maybe not necessarily make it safe for women, but at least it makes it inclusive. Uh, but, but again, until we address this issue really up front, I, I would say it's hard to go to girls um, in middle school or high school, right, that are looking at at you know their future careers and say hey come into these industries um, because they're not going to be respected or it's not safe so 
uh, you know, I'm just going to boil it down to training and and being comfortable sharing if there is something that that you feel very very threatened or intimidated or heaven forbid something that was acted upon yeah i would like to add to that like education educating people we cannot forget that um, i mean at lobbies we're from all around the globe so we're a distributed company we work with people that is working from australia india spain where i am the states like everywhere all around the world we come from different backgrounds, right? So I think the co companies need to establish a culture and they need to very clearly state how they expect their employees to behave. And, and that's a culture of the company, right? This is what we expect of our environment. And that could only happen, as Jane just said, through education and trainings. So, hey guys, this is how we expect you to you know, behave as developers, pro program managers or whatever. This is the environment that we are gonna that we want to have. These are our values, and it doesn't matter where you come from. We're gonna help you to get there with this training. So then there's a common understanding on how to treat your peers, no matter where they come from, no matter what their gender is. And then you have a baseline. Everything that is outside of that, you know, it's kind of you know questionable. And I think that most of companies don't have those values nor that culture, and that's why it's hard as a woman to say, okay, I think I'm being mistreated because there's not really a place where you can go and say, okay, this is expected behavior. So that's a problem. So I think establishing culture, the culture of the company and training employees, like the unconscious bias training. I did that one at Alassian and it was, you know, fantastic. So I think that's the way to go. Like making sure people understand, like have a common understanding of the expectations and training them to meet those. Right. Thank yeah, you. I agree. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I agree completely with what you just said. That's one of the reasons why I work for Adobe because it is such a the culture here is phenomenal, and uh, and we're hiring too, by the way. <laughs> just to say, <laughs> you said it, Isabel. <laughs> so, I just say too. Uh, but one of the things that I think is really, really, really important that we are not doing, and that those of us that are a little more mature in the in the seat uh, that have been in the business for a while. I think we have to reach out. I think we have to actually touch the people that are around us and actually say, you know, are you okay? Uh, what's happening? What's your experience? And I know as a manager and as a senior manager, I definitely encourage all the managers under me and any of the, you know, the reports directly to me that, um, you know, I ask the question, how are you doing here? Are you feeling comfortable? And I do that with every person on my team, not just for women. Because I think you'll find that as you start to ask these questions, you'll find that men um, have similar feelings uh, for different races, for different, maybe they're shorter or taller or larger or smaller, whatever it is, everyone has a personal thing that makes them feel different than someone else. And, uh, and there are subtleties that those sensitive, you know, you're sensitive to your environment when, you know, if I'm short and, and uh, everyone else is tall and people are constantly talking about me being short, uh, you, you become sensitive to that environment and you become hurt and, and, uh, and it creates these things. So I think that women are also, you know, feeling, uh, you know, particularly with something as serious as sexual harassment, um, to me that, uh, you know, hope, I'd like to think that those egregious things don't happen in, in the software industry um, day to day. I mean, I, I know what happens outside when you're at, you know, outside of the workplace, but um, I'd like to think that, as uh, Jane said, that most people are um, looking for, um, you know, are, are, are kind of, un, un, uh, you know, unintentional. They, they, they are unconscious about what they're doing. And it's important for us uh, mature folks to actually bring it to the table and bring it conscious. And, and call it out. So I, I often, uh, in one-on-one -on -one with an employee, say, hey, did you notice when you said something the other day, did you see someone else's reaction to that? And uh, have, have you noticed that that might be perceived differently? And uh, to really call it out and keep it on the table. That's my two cents. Great, thank you. And you know what, this discussion has been really great. And as always, I feel like we could talk on and on and because there's been really great content you, got, you guys have brought up some things that are really good, but we are a little over. We're just going to go spend maybe just a few more minutes basically as wrap-up and to maybe one last thought about like 
what should we do to encourage more women in, in the industry and at your company? So uh, with that, I'd really like to do a quick um, go around. And uh, But before we do that, I wanted to thank you guys for being such awesome panelists. I wanted to thank the audience for asking such great questions. Um, Max has actually uh, uh, provided his email address. So if you have an, any additional questions, please send them on. And what we're going to do is uh, create a document and then share it with the people who attended this call, with share all the answers with everyone who attended the call. And more importantly, uh, we encourage everyone to join the Slack channel. So with that, uh, Jane, would you like to go first and basically uh, do a, a one wrap up and like you know, very quickly, how would you encourage more women or more and more minorities into uh, into the tech field? Be yourself, all right. Be yourself. I think that's the message. Don't try to be. A man, don't try to be taller, shorter, different ethnicity, uh, learn golf, learn video games, be you, right? And so I'm going to wrap up with uh, wisdom. I actually have this on my phone. Wisdom greater than mine, and it is the wisdom of Dr. Seuss. So Dr. Seuss has a great quote that says, today you are you, that is truer than true. There was no one alive who is youer than you. And I would say that to me is the greatest piece of advice. Just be you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I would say do whatever makes you happy. Um, you don't need to be a leader. You don't need to be a manager. You don't need to be a C. Do choose whatever makes you happy and satisfied and, and, and things that you enjoy because you're going to spend at least eight hours a day, you know, doing that. So you better do something that is satisfying for you. And if, you know, you get bored, just, you know, do something else. There are lots of things to do in this field. And that's an important thing. Like, you know, in order to get more women into the field, uh, I think, you know, going to high schools and tell them, hey, this is all you can do. I was told that, you know, there were little options. I got here in, in this field because of maths. I was a math lover. Um, and, you know, an engineer, and there are lots of maths. Um, but there are lots of opportunities. You can do a lot of stuff from, you know, hard tech to things to help people um, have better lives, like, I don't know, companies like Cochlear with, you know, the earring um, and things and, you know, tools for developers. So there are so many things that you can do. So don't just get stuck with the idea of the kind of, you know, nerdy field. Try to understand more the different roles that are there and try to do something that satisfies you every day because you spend so much time doing that. Don't, don't waste your time. Excellent. That's it. Yeah, just my final thought is not so much, again, looking at that success criteria, and I think that's what both Jane and Isabel are talking about, is define success for yourself. Um, but also, you know, if you want to get into the tech field, don't just look at the CEOs, don't just look at the, the um, you know, what, what maybe the, the um, culture defines as, as success. You know, look at what you, you know, look at it, uh, look at the middle layer of management and look for those people that are very happy in what they do and they're very satisfied with their jobs and, um, and talk with them, talk with women, uh, you know, try to highlight the women that are the worker bees that are very happy with what they do and are contributing to a company and are valued by their company and, uh, and their family values what they do in their industry. And I think that that's something that, you know, we forget as, as people that it's not all about climbing that corporate rat ladder. It's about finding that position that you are most comfortable at and that you're most, that, that, that uh, makes you excel and makes you the best you can be. And, and that's uh, much more important, I think, than finding that corporate ladder. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, have a great day. And then, Isabel, thank you again, and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.